I'm Dr. Stuart Eaves and I work for Surrey Satellite Technology where I'm one of the people who describes himself as an ideas guy and tries to think up new missions for satellite systems. This presentation is about advanced satellite technology and it's based on some of the work that Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, a UK based company which was a spin off from the University of Surrey in the UK, are doing to advance the technologies that they operate on largely small satellites in the space environment. Uh, the contents of this presentation uh, are going to focus mostly on surveillance, but I'll then mention developments in the areas of communication and navigation. I'll touch a little on the uh, space environment and the issues that we have with space debris and then I'll conclude by talking a little bit about the trend towards the commercial exploitation of space which is starting to take over from uh, the governmental uh, exploitation of space which is what we've seen uh, historically. So to start with the surveillance topic, um, this satellite uh, known as TopSat was launched about uh, 10 years ago in 2005. Uh, to provide a sense of scale, uh, it weighs 120 kilograms uh, and is about the size of a domestic refrigerator. The thing that made TopSat unique was that unlike more conventional satellites which stare straight down at the ground um, underneath them as they orbit. Uh, TopSat quite deliberately uh, would pitch backwards as it went over the top of a particular target region. The advantage of this technique is that uh, by comparison with a conventional satellite which is dragging its sensor across the ground at the orbital rate of about seven and a half kilometers a second uh, the pitching motion of TopSat slows the effective ground rate of the sensor so that there is more time for more light to get into the camera system and that allows you to get back much closer to the diffraction limited performance of the optics which in TopSat's case was uh, a primary aperture of about 20 centimeters in diameter. As a result of the pitching that TopSat did, it was able to generate images with a resolution on the ground of about two and a half meters. And due to its small size, it set a world record for uh, resolution per mass of satellite. And uh, the real hardware was obviously launched into space. Uh, the engineering model, the practice version of TopSat, uh, was put on display in the Science Museum in London. This is the sort of image that we were achieving with TopSat uh, a decade ago. Uh, it shows uh, a place called Cranwell uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, you can see from the presence of clouds in the image that uh, you're still getting uh, reasonable resolution, radio, reasonable radiometric resolution. Uh, on the images despite the small size of the TopSat imager. You might like to compare this with what we're doing today in 2015. This is a constellation of three uh, disaster monitoring constellation satellites. They're shown in the upper right. They're rather larger than TopSat. The total length of the satellites is now approaching four meters and uh, the satellites have a primary aperture that's in excess of 40 centimetres and they're able to generate images with a better than one metre ground resolution. Uh, the principal image here shows the Olympic Park in Athens in Greece. For students of optical design, the DMC3 satellites have a rather different camera to the one used by TopSat. Uh, TopSat was a three-mirror astigmatic uh, camera system with fairly complex mirror shapes. Uh, in some senses, the uh, optical design of the DMC-3 satellites is more conventional in the sense that it's a Newtonian optics, so the light enters the primary aperture, bounces off a large curved mirror which sends the light back up the telescope tube 
to a planar mirror which takes the light outside the telescope tube where a number of mirrors and uh, uh, lenses are used to focus the light down onto the uh, detector array. The particular advantage of using small satellites with body-mounted solar panels is that the satellites themselves can be considerably more agile, uh, enabling operational modes that a larger satellite with deployed uh, and potentially vibrating solar panels would find it very difficult to emulate. The uh, extended strip imaging that's shown on this slide is the sort of thing that a conventional satellite would do, and uh, a satellite like DMC3 or TopSat can easily achieve this mode too. Shown to the left of that is uh, a highly agile mode where a number of point targets can be accessed in a given satellite pass. This obviously assumes that you know where your satellite uh, imagery targets are in advance, but if you don't know where your targets are, you may prefer to put the satellite into an area mode where essentially you nod the satellite and uh, provide adjacent strips of coverage, uh, making up uh, a square array as shown here. The satellite has enough agility to follow a line of communication, which is shown on the right of this slide. Uh, in this particular illustration, the line of communication is a river, uh, but clearly it could easily be a road or a railway. Uh, or indeed the border between two countries or a coastline. Any linear feature um, within reason can be followed by the satellite. The impasse stereo mode shown in this slide uh, is one which assumes that the satellite takes one image of its target region as it approaches and then pitches backwards in order to take a second image um, with an appropriate angle to ger generate a stereo pair. A typical angle between the two images would be about 40 degrees. When the two images are combined, you can derive information on uh, the 3D features of the scene, uh, the buildings and hills, etc. Example of change detection imaging, which is shown on the right of this slide. Uh, most satellites have multiple detectors on their focal planes and um, due to the layout of the detectors on the focal plane and the motion of the satellite. What that effectively means is that you have multiple images, uh, perhaps in different spectral wave bands, of the same region on the ground. What you're able to do with those uh, different spectral bands, in this case, is subtract one from another. And because the different imaging uh, bands are collected at very slightly different times, uh, if you subtract those images, you can actually detect motion within the scene. So vehicles, or in this case, aircraft moving around, um, can be detected as uh, the presence and absence of the objects in the change detection imagery. On the right of this image is an example of how small satellites can be particularly relevant to a tactical scenario. Uh, larger satellites tend to have to wait uh, to be commanded and then once they've taken their imagery have to wait again in order to uh, deliver their imagery to the ground station. A demonstrated mode with TopSat was that we waited until the satellite came over the horizon and sent it to command and its agility enabled it to accept that command, uh, orientate itself in order to uh, take an image of the specified location and then having taken that image uh, spend the next couple of minutes downlinking the data uh, that had been acquired to a ground station within the theatre that had just had its image taken. Um, so the entire process uh, was achieved in considerably less than 10 minutes. The low elevation mode shown in the centre of this slide is not one that you would normally use over land-based areas, pointing out towards the horizon extends the slant range that you're working with, you're looking through more atmosphere and there's usually quite a lot of terrain obscuration, so hills, buildings and trees etc 
would deny you access to quite a lot of the ground surface if you look at a very oblique angle. However, if you're interested in doing surveillance of the maritime domain, uh, an advantage of an, a low, low elevation mode is that the uh, satellite's footprint is artificially expanded by the curvature of the Earth. So you put down a fixed size footprint, but as the Earth's surface curves away, uh, that image footprint is spread over a larger area and it becomes easier to detect ships. And then finally, in the left of this image is an example of super resolution mode imaging. So, in this particular satellite, it has uh, a linear imager, uh, a very long uh, line of pixels similar to the sort of detector that you would find in a photocopier or a scanner. The normal thing to do with that sort of uh, imaging sensor is to present it at 90 degrees to the direction of travel of the satellite and that allows you to collect the maximum swath width on the ground. But as this slide shows, you have a choice. Uh, if you wished, you can uh, yaw the spacecraft to present the same sensor at an angle to the direction of travel of the satellite. And then you're presenting exactly the same number of pixels to a narrower swath on the ground. And the uh, consequence of that is that you end up oversampling in the across track direction. If you then adopt the same pitching motion as was described previously for TopSat, you can oversample in the along track direction as well. And what you're left with is a nested set of uh, observations of the ground where you're seeing any given location on the surface of the Earth more than once. And if you then know a friendly mathematician who can unwrap that data for you, uh, you can derive an improvement to the effective resolution uh, of the imager. And in the case of um, uh, a 45 degree angle, it's about a 1 over root 2 uh, improvement in the baseline resolution of the imagery. Another advantage of an agile satellite is that it expands the number of different local times of day that you can actually collect imagery. The lighter blue bands shown closer to the terminator on this image are the typical local times uh, that a large satellite with a downward staring sensor would collect data. So typically from about 10 in the morning to about 11.30 and then again from about 12.30 in the afternoon to about 2 in the afternoon. And the reason that this time period is so constrained is that uh, the satellite is looking to collect a fairly fixed amount of light from the scene below it uh, in order to generate a decent radiometric performance in the imagery. A pitching satellite that can vary the ground speed can collect more light if it needs to and as a result a satellite like TopSat can uh, operate much closer to the day-night terminator um, extending the imaging times to most of the sunlit portion of the day. We are approaching a time in the near future where we think we will be able to collect imagery at night. Uh, this image wasn't collected by an SSTL spacecraft, it was actually uh, acquired by an imager that was carried on the International Space Station and in this case the camera was mounted in one of the viewing ports on the International Space Station and the camera was pitched backwards as the Interna International Space Station flew over the United Kingdom. What's shown sort of the large bright point in the uh, sort of centre of the cent lower centre of the image is London and then there are various other major cities uh, in the UK that are visible uh, in the image. And we expect this sort of imaging using moonlight and street lighting to become much more common in the future as detector technologies continue to improve. A further advantage is that we're able to use uh, rather less conventional um, orbits for our imaging sensors. 
So shown on the left here is a globe of the Earth with various orbital inclinations. Many imaging satellites operate in the near-polar sun-synchronous orbits and the corresponding coverage pattern is shown as polar on the map of the Earth. What that coverage pattern illustrates is that uh, coverage of the poles, the North and South Poles, happens very frequently, uh, approximately every 90 to 100 minutes. And uh, unfortunately, what we would prefer is that the coverage, which is rather more diffuse down near the equator, um, was the places where the satellite is actually able to generate uh, imagery that uh, paying customers will seek to buy from us. What we would like to do, therefore, is to use an, an orbit that's inclined at, say, 45 degrees to the um, Earth's equator, and the coverage patterns shown by satellites at different inclinations are illustrated on the map. You can see that um, if you bring the orbital inclination down, you get many more passes per day at lower latitude regions. The difficulty for a large satellite of using these multiple passes over a given target area is that um, by definition, if you have multiple passes a day, they must occur at different local times when there is a different amount of light available from the sun. Uh, a satellite that's capable of pitching and controlling the amount of light that its camera sees can generate decent imagery at any local time of the day.